board. And then, yeah, Mr. Dason, you're Hi, everyone. ready to go. Thank you very much. I hope you are doing well. I hope that you're having a good afternoon. It is nice to get to see you. Nice to be here with you. Uh, I figure you might want to know a little bit about this guy who's talking to you about Bible translations. Um, so yeah, don't worry, I'm not going to talk about myself for like a long time. But I feel like, you know, it's, sometimes it's helpful, particularly on something that's a little bit nuanced, like Bible translations. Um, so I, uh, I, I have a master's in biblical languages, which particularly is Hebrew, biblical Hebrew and biblical Greek. Biblical uh, languages also include Aramaic, but my training is not in that. So if you have any questions about Aramaic, I can't help you with that. But, you know, that's only like five chapters of the Bible or so. Most of it's in Hebrew and Greek. So, that, so I have a master's in that. I have a PhD in Holocaust studies. And uh, the, my focus of study there was actually in Jewish and Christian relations um, and the impact of the Christian scriptures, primarily the Gospel of John, on those relations. So I did a lot of, of work in the Christian scriptures and kind of translating those and whatnot. Um, so there you go. That's, that's enough about that. But just, just so that you know a few things before I start like saying stuff about you know, various languages and how this all fits together. So you might have noticed as we started this, oh, wait, before I start, I do want to say, if you feel like really moved to ask a question or something like that, I'm totally fine with it. If you put it in the chat, I will stop what I'm doing and I'll answer it. Um, I, I teach middle school, so I'm also really used to being interrupted. So if you, if you, <laughs> decide and yeah, maybe some of you were middle school teachers so you know what i'm talking about if uh if you feel like really moved to ask a question and you think oh you know i gotta ask this i don't want to type it in the chat and you just unmute and you ask the question i'm not gonna be mad i'm not gonna you know say hey you should have typed that or something that's totally fine so i don't i, I you know i don't want to have let's not have it happen like 50 times in the class but it's it's a uh, it's fine for that to that to happen so no big deal okay so let's get started the challenge of bible translation i find this course to be really really fun now fun might not be the first word you think of when you think of translating the bible uh but for me i i think it's incredibly fun because um i grew up and maybe you had this the same kind of experience i grew up with a very simplistic understanding of just life in general of history and of the way that things worked and i found that the more i've studied and the more i've learned the more i realized oh like this cut and dry way that i view the world just isn't really possible it's not really a real a real thing like everything is incredibly complex and I kind of like that, like, and I, I hope that you, that as we go through this, that you'll kind of enjoy it too. Um, this, this course is really going to be looking at why Bible translation is hard and uh, what that means for those of us who are looking at the Bible and how we understand it. So that's, that's what we're going to take from this. All right. So this first part, before we, before we take a break, this is what I want us to think about. These are our two sections here. I always try and have two or three sections. So for this first section, before the break, we're going to talk about math versus language. Uh, now, if any of you are math teachers or language teachers or have been previously, you might appreciate this. And then we're going to talk about translation philosophy and uh, what translation philosophy is. Now, I find that it's really helpful for me in grasping a topic to try and distill everything down to like one message. So for the first hour, here's the plan. The big thing I want you to take from this is translation is complicated. That's not too bad, right? 
three words. Translation is complicated. So that's that's my goal. If you remember that, I'll feel happy. Hopefully you'll feel happy. And you know, it'll all it'll all be good. Uh, in addition, I think it's really helpful for us to ask questions. So maybe you have experienced this. Those of you who read the Bible, have you ever asked a friend, well, what version do you read from? You know, asked that question and found that, you know, oh, they read from the King James Version. Or they read from the New Living Translation or something like that. And you look at your Bible and it says English Standard Version. And you look at that and you think, huh, I wonder why they're different. Like, why, why are there so many? Or maybe, maybe you've gone into like a, a Bible bookstore or something like that. Have you ever had that experience? You go into one of these bookstores and you walk up to the Bible shelf and there's all of these different versions there. King James. New King James, New Living, English Standard, New American Standard. Like, and you look at it and you think, whoa, what are all these? What are all the differences here? And which one do I want? Something like that. So that's something I want us to be thinking about. And hopefully I can help open that up a little bit. I will tell you, um, I grew up reading from the King James Version which was interesting for me. Does anybody know when the King James Version was first published? Any, anyone heard about that? There was a big thing recently because it had its 400th anniversary. That gives you an idea of how old it is. <laughs> so so that, was, uh, that was in 2011. So you work backwards. It was 1611 when the first King James Version was published. Now, uh, I actually have a friend, and this was kind of a crazy story. I have a friend who found a 1613 King James version in her attic. So that was, that was kind of a, whoa, type of moment. But anyway, that's beside the point. But so I grew up, I grew up uh, reading from the King James and obviously it's 400 years old. So that makes a big difference. You know, have you ever tried reading Shakespeare, right? You read Shakespeare compared to reading something now and if you've read Shakespeare, you probably have the kind of experience where you read it and you stop and you look and you think, what? Like, what did he just say? You know, or like, I didn't even know those were words. You know, have you had that experience? <laughs> like, like you look at it and you try and figure out what's going on here. So um, it, this was really helpful for me. And, and as I started to look into more versions, that was when I decided I wanted to go to graduate school, do this, uh, this degree in biblical languages, and it has been a fascinating journey. So uh, I want to work on that journey together, and I hope that you enjoy this. So let's talk about math versus language. Now, you may have been the kind of person who despised math in school. Um, you know, we, we have that kind of thing. I, I teach math. I, well, I, you know, I don't really know what I should say. I end up Basically, I'm, I'm the principal of, of a private school, and I end up filling in for, like, whenever whenever we can't find a teacher to teach something. So I, I teach, like, all kinds of crazy stuff. I've taught kindergarten and preschool, and so, <laughs> you know. But so uh, we got math. Let's think about this. Math is straightforward and logical. Although when you get into kind of the upper math, it might not feel very logical, although it is. But math is pretty straightforward and logical. So therefore, if somebody were to give you this equation, there is one answer for x, right? x, x isn't going to equal anything else. Now, if any of you want to get all like complicated, maybe you can figure out like some kind of imaginary number or something that, that also could be x. But uh, for the most part, X is only one thing. Anybody know what it is, by the way? This isn't a math class, so it's okay if you don't know. I I'm gonna I'm gonna cheat because I actually forgot what the answer was. So I'm gonna I'm gonna look it up. It uh, so let's see. You're gonna have 12 times 3 is 36 x and 37 x. Okay, so 481 divided by 37. All right, so the answer is 13. It's good I checked because. I had it in the back of my head that it was 19. And that would be really bad if I told you the wrong thing. Okay, so 13 is the answer. There's not another answer here, right? 
Now, if you want one that's a little less complicated, like nine times nine, 81. Now, if somebody walked up to you and said, oh, did you know that nine times nine is 76? Now, you would probably look at them and think, you know, who is this person? Like, where did they go to school? Or something like that. Um, I don't know, you know, or, or you might think, oh, they're trying to be clever. But for the most part, like math is pretty cut and dry. It's very straightforward. You have your equation. There's one answer. There's times when there's more than one answer. But for the most part, that's, that's what you're looking at, right? Language is not like that. So English is very different. So let me ask you this. If somebody asked you for your favorite food, I want you to just think about this. Your favorite food. How many different ways do you think you could answer that question? Probably a lot, right? Like, my favorite food is hash browns. I love potatoes. Now, if I were going to say, like, that I like hash browns, think about this. You know, these are different ways that I could say hash browns are my favorite. Different ways that I could answer that question. I could say hash browns are just the best. I love hash browns because they're so crispy. Once when I was in, that's supposed to say New England. Sorry for my typo. Once when I was in New England, I had the most amazing hash brown. All right. And you could probably come up with a lot of other ways too. You know, who knows? Uh, there's, there's tons. So that's the funny thing about English, right? You're basically saying the same thing. So you're giving the same answer, but you're not giving the same answer at the same time. Okay. Now I recognize this is just a silly example, right? But I think it brings out sort of the difficulty with language. So let's talk Spanish a little bit. Tango hombre. Anybody want to translate that for us? So tango hombre into English translates as I have hunger. If you want to be really literal, right? Really literal, translates to I have hunger. Now, this one's my favorite. Me gusta el pollo. Okay. Me gusta el pollo, if you're being very literal, you would translate to this to the chicken likes me. Okay. Or como se llama? That would be how do you call yourself? Now, that's literal, right? This is not what these things mean. So if you decide to start speaking Spanish and you say, oh, you know, I, I went to this class at CSUDH and, and, you know, we talked about Spanish. So, uh, me gusta el pollo. Look at that chicken. It really likes me. People are going to think you're crazy because that's not, this isn't what it actually means in Spanish. Right. But if you were translating it literally, this is what you would translate it as. The chicken likes me. So this is a better translation. I am hungry. I like chicken. What is your name? Now, that middle one there, you will notice, is very, very different. The chicken likes me versus I like chicken. <laughs> one, one, you know, is not so good for the chicken. The other one works out pretty good. So the reason that this is important is it's helpful for us to recognize that when you're looking at translations, saying... Oh, this translation is a word for word translation. Well, that doesn't always mean it's the best. So what's opening up right here is this idea of translation philosophy. When a translator goes to translate the Bible, they have to decide, am I going to translate as though this is math? Am I going to say, this word equals this word in English. This word equals this word in English. Or am I going to say, well, you know, in Spanish, this is tango hambre. Uh, really, what that means is that you're hungry, right? So I'm going to translate it as I'm hungry. And so that's part of the reason that we have so many different versions, because different translators are trying to figure out, well, you know, what do people want? Do they want one that has a word-for-word -word equivalence? Or do they want one that captures the meaning? 
behind it. Okay, so let me give you an example here. So this is the King James Version of Genesis 1 verse 1. So the King James Version is the best-selling book of all time, which, I mean, you know, the, the competition isn't that fierce because it has been around 400 years, right? So it, it had kind of a jump on a lot of, a lot of books. The best-selling version currently of the Bible is the New International Version. So it took that spot in 1984. It's the New International Version. So the King James, this is how the first verse of the Bible in the King James Version reads. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Now what I want to do, that verse, by the way, might be familiar to, to some of you. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Now I want to show you the New King James. See if you notice any difference. So this is the New King James. This came out in the 1980s. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, you're going to have to look at this really closely. Do you see any difference between the two? All right, what do you notice? Plural. Plural. Yeah, that's heavens. right. Heavens. You got it. So in the beginning, God created the heavens, plural, right? And the earth. So you got heavens. Okay. Interesting. Here's the new international version. So this is the best-selling version currently. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So you might notice that the new King James and the NIV, these are word for word the same. So the big difference between that and the King James is King James is singular, New King James and NIV is plural. This is the English Standard Version. The English Standard Version is a favorite among um, more fundamentalist groups. So English Standard says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now I'm going to ask you this one. This one's probably even trickier. Do you see what's different with this one? The comma. Oh, yeah, you got it. Yep, so the comma. Now, here's what's, here's what's fascinating. Do you know how many commas are in the Hebrew? So the Old Testament was written in Hebrew, except for those like five, six chapters in Aramaic that I mentioned. Do you know how many commas there are in the Hebrew of the Old Testament? None. Ah, yes, it was a trick question. <laughs> you got it. So Hebrew doesn't have punctuation. So there were no commas. There were no periods. There were no exclamation points. Nothing like that. So any, any punctuation that you see when you are reading a translation is actually put in by the translators. So that's a helpful thing to be aware of. Now, I don't know. Again, here's my, here's my middle school teacherness coming out. Has anybody here ever seen the, the book called um, uh, Eat, Shoots, and Leaves? Okay, I I recommend it if you uh, if you ever feel like reading something that's kind of funny, you can you can go ahead and and buy it. You can find it for like five six dollars on Amazon if you buy it used. It's called Eat Shoots and Leaves, and uh, the whole point is the importance of commas. So it's it says this could either so the title is Eat Shoots and Leaves. This could either be about a panda because it eats, shoots and leaves, right? Shoots and leaves are things that it eats. And that would be without any commas, eats, shoots, and leaves. Or it could be about a panda with a bow and arrow that eats, comma, shoots, comma, and then leaves, right? So anyway, it's silly. It's like a book of, it has like 20 pages worth of these kind of things where it's illustrations of like, here's what it's like without a comma. Here's what it means. Here's what it means with a comma. Right. There's a, there's a few different ones that the same author has made. Um, but this is one of the fascinating things about Bible translation is there's no punctuation, right? So Bible translators can add punctuation depending on what they think it means. And in doing that, you can change a lot of the meaning there. My, my favorite one was always um, let's eat grandma. You probably heard that one. The let's eat grandma versus let's eat grandma, right? So that that's a big difference. Commas save lives, you know, is what people say. So, so there you go. That's the idea. So yeah, the ESV has a comma. 
kind of interesting, right? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, in this case, it doesn't make a big difference, but there are cases where it does. Okay. This is the New American Standard Bible. I don't know if you've heard of this one before. It is considered the most literal translation uh, recently. So it came out, I think, the 1980s, 1990s. And uh, it, it was interestingly translated in La Habra. So it was a group, of, a group of scholars who came together in La Habra. And when they first translated it, they didn't tell anybody who they were. It's kind of like the you know, mysterious secret Bible. So they, they translated this, and uh, then after it came out, and I, I don't know, maybe after it was well-received, they told everybody who they were, but uh, uh, it's from the Lachman Foundation in La Habra, and it's considered to be the most literal, so like um, more math-like in terms of there's this word-for-word -word correspondence. But you will notice it's the same as the New King James, the NIV, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So there's... One of the big differences, as you pointed out, singular versus plural, heaven or heavens. Well, here's the word in Hebrew. Now, Hebrew is read from right to left. Whoa, sorry, wait a second. My screen just like shrunk. Um, Hebrew is read from right to left and it doesn't use the same alphabet as we use. So this would be pronounced shamayim. It would start over here. And these things underneath, the letters are vowels. So Hebrew also doesn't have vowels. These were invented in the Middle Ages, these vowels. So ancient Hebrew did not have vowels. Um, and in fact, the reason that these vowels are underneath the letters, if you're wondering, you know, why not in the middle? Uh, it's because the Masoretes, they're the a Jewish group who invented these vowels, um, they felt that the text was so sacred, the biblical text was so sacred that they couldn't add anything to it. So they wrote underneath it. So that's where those vowels come from. Now, it was always pronounced. So this word was always shamayim, but it just didn't have the vowels in it before. So the Masoretes are the ones who said, okay, here's some vowel sounds. Sha, so that ah uh, sound, we'll make it this little T looking thing down at the bottom. So they're the ones who assigned uh, a symbol to the vowel sounds that were being made. So the vowels always existed, but they just hadn't been written out, if that makes sense. Okay. For people who don't know Hebrew, there is a book called Strong's Concordance. And uh, it was this guy named James Strong in the 1800s who went through and he assigned a number to every biblical word. So if you see it here, it says H. 8064. So this is the number for the word heavens. H means Hebrew. 8064 is its number. The reason that that is useful is because if you look up in his book, the number 8064, it'll show you every place that the word heaven comes up, that this word shows up. And sometimes it's not always translated as heaven. It'll be translated sometimes as sky and all that kind of thing. So that's why it's useful to be able to trace the Hebrew word through. That's called a Strong's Concordance. Okay. Now, a dynamic translation, so one that is not like word for word, but that's trying to capture the meaning, would probably say something like heaven. So in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. A more literal translation would say heavens, because this word here, shamayim, is actually plural. So in case you were wondering, well, why is the King James singular, and why are these other translations plural? It comes down to translation philosophy. You know, are you trying to capture the meaning or are you trying to capture what the grammar says? So this heavens is plural because the Hebrew is plural. Now here's where it gets really crazy. Ready for this? In Hebrew, there's actually a way to say two of something. So for instance, if you wanted to say um, like that you had two hands, which you, you, know, you probably would say because you do have two hands. So if you wanted to say two hands, you'd say yadaim. So yad is the word for hand. And that aim sound at the end, aim, that's how you say two of them. So it doesn't just mean plural. It means two. It's kind of a funny thing about Hebrew, kind of a cool thing, actually. Like, I wish we could say that in English. But in English, we just have to say two. But in Hebrew, there's a specific ending to show two. And you actually have it in this word. So I'd said yadaim, 
hear that ayim ending? Well, it's here too. Shamaim. Shamaim. So this, if you wanted to be really literal, would actually translate to two heavens. So that kind of creates an interesting question of Genesis 1 verse 1. Because the literal Hebrew would read, in the beginning, God created the two heavens and the earth. Huh. You know, what? what's that mean? That's interesting. Like, two heavens? Now, the reason probably that you're not going to see any translations that say that is because there's only one word in Hebrew to mean heaven or heavens, and it's Shemayim. You know, there isn't, there isn't a way to say heaven in the singular um so it's just it's kind of like a funny word so translators have to wrestle with this how literal do we want to be because if we say two heavens it probably doesn't make any sense and and a lot of people just get confused so kind of interesting now here's the whole verse in the hebrew here's what it looks like i'll read it to you remember you start on the right and go to the left so in hebrew you'd start over here on the right and this would be bareshit that's your first word, bara, Elohim, eight hashamayim. So there's our word shamayim, va eight haaretz. That's the whole verse in Hebrew. Now I want to talk to you about this beginning part because I think it's really helpful to bring out. You know, we're just looking at one verse, the first verse in the Bible, and it gets pretty complicated. Okay, so check this out. Most translations will start with these words. In the beginning. So you're probably familiar with reading that. In the beginning, God did this. He created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning. Now, what's interesting about that is that the Hebrew doesn't actually say in the beginning. The Hebrew actually says in a beginning. Now, at first you might say, well, why does that matter? You know, does, that make it, does that actually make a difference in a beginning? And I would say, well, it could, because if you say in the beginning, that implies that there's just one beginning, right? If you say in a beginning, that implies that there's multiple beginnings, right? You know, there could be two, three, four. So, you know, what, what exactly is that about? And I, I'll tell you, some theologians actually think it should be translated as in a beginning because they'll say that's where things like dinosaurs came from, from a different translation, or from a different, not translation, a different creation, something like that. You know, they were from a creation that happened previously. And they'll work on the basis of the Hebrew grammar to argue that. Now, I want to tell you a little bit of interesting background. You'll see on the screen where it says LXX. LXX, those are actually Roman numerals. So that in Roman numerals equals 70. L is 50, X is 10. So together that equals 70. This is an abbreviation for a Bible version called the Septuagint, which uh, Septuagint, you know, if you're thinking 70, right, you can kind of see the connection there. Septuagint means 70 in Greek. And so the language that follows it is Greek. So this is in Greek. Greek is read like English. So you read left to right. This is en arche. That's how you would pronounce that, en arche. Now, you might be wondering, what does this have to do with anything? Why are we suddenly talking about a Greek version? Well, here's why. This Septuagint version was the first translation ever of the bible so the first version of it dates to about 200 bce so that's that's you know a long time ago 200 bce let me tell you a little bit about the history of it nobody knows for sure where it came from that's kind of how it works with super old stuff right so nobody knows for sure where it came from but here's the legend so this is this is the legend of of where the Septuagint version originated. So Alexander the Great, he starts in Greece, right? Alexander the Great takes over most of the world at the time. This is in the 300s BCE. 300s BCE. When he is 
Anyone know how old he was when he died? Alexander the Great? Alexander the Great was in his early 30s. Early 30s when he died. He's said to have cried because there was nothing else for him to conquer. So he conquers most of the unknown world, you know, that, that whole kind of thing. Okay. So he conquers all of that. He dies in his early 30s. His generals have a big war over who's going to take over the empire. It's kind of the story of human history. So they have this, they have this fight. Two generals become the main people. One is named Seleucid. That's his last name. His name is Seleucid, and he rules over Persia and like the Middle East. So he rules over Persia and the Middle East. The other general is named Ptolemy, and he rules over Egypt. So can you kind of picture that in your mind? You have Seleucid in the Middle East, Seleucus. You have Ptolemy in Egypt. Well, Ptolemy realizes that there are a lot of books in the world. And it's really important to him to collect books. So Ptolemy starts collecting books and he creates the library at Alexandria. So if you've ever heard of Alexandria's library, you know, and it's fame for learning and all of that, that's owed to Ptolemy. Okay, so one of the books he wants to get is the Bible. However, the Bible is written in Hebrew and Ptolemy can't read Hebrew. So he says, you know, this isn't going to work. I don't... I don't want this book I can't read, so I want a translation of it. So he sends to Jerusalem, and he says, send me 70 of the best Hebrew scholars. I want them to translate the Bible into Greek. And this is supposedly the legend of where the Septuagint version comes from. That's kind of an interesting story. Um, you know, it, it also gets embellished as time goes on, as legends tend to do, right? So, so like... One of the versions says all 70 scholars sat in different rooms and they all made their own translation. And then when they came together, amazingly, all the translations were word for word exactly the same. You know, uh, okay, all right. That's a little too legendy for me. But, uh, you know, <laughs> we, don't, we don't know exactly where it came from, but that's about the right time. So that's the first translation ever of the Bible. And the reason that it's really important, particularly for people who are Christians, is because it's likely the version of the Bible that Jesus read and the version of the Bible that Paul used. So if you look at the quotations of the Jewish scriptures, like if you go into the Gospels or you go into the, the letters that Paul wrote, you'll notice that they're all in Greek, first of all. So they're all written in Greek. And the quotations that Jesus and Paul have of the Jewish scriptures are often word for word from the Septuagint version. So kind of, kind of interesting, right? You know, like you would, you would maybe expect that Jesus would have read out of the Hebrew, but the, in fact, it seems like he, he works out of the Septuagint. Okay. All of that was a really long winded way of saying that the Septuagint kind of matters. So the Septuagint also happens to read for Genesis 1 verse 1. It reads en arche, which is in Greek a way of saying in a beginning. Now the Septuagint gets quoted in the Gospels as well. In John chapter 1 verse 1, there's a quotation of Genesis 1 verse 1. In the beginning is how your English translation will read. So if you look at John 1 verse 1, it will say in the beginning as a quotation of Genesis 1 verse 1. But if you read the Greek, it actually doesn't say in the beginning. It says in a beginning. Huh, right? Intriguing. Okay. So that's that. Now, here's where it gets really trippy. Ready? That word barishit, I've already mentioned it could be translated as in the beginning, which is what most translations say. Or if you want to be really literal, you could say in a beginning. Now, if you want to be a little looser, you could say when God began. Now that's slightly different. So the Anchor Bible is a set of scholarly commentaries, but uh, even though they're commentaries, they all start with a translation. So that's how it translates it, when God began. And the reason that it does that is because 
Bareshit, the specific Hebrew construction, is a dependent clause, meaning that it's like a clause that can't stand alone. So it would be like saying, if I go to the store, that's a dependent clause, right? It, you can't just say that. If you walked up to, you know, somebody that you live with, your roommate or whatever, and you said, if I go to the store, and then you just stopped, they'd say, yeah, if you go to the store, what? You know, you're going to buy cheese or something? Or So that's a dependent clause. It needs something else. So in Hebrew, this is a dependent clause. So the Anger Bible tries to capture that idea of a dependent clause. When God began, when God began what? Right, you can feel that you need something else to it. Okay, the word biblical commentary translates this as, in the beginning of God's creation. So rather than, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, this says, in the beginning of God's creation. A little bit different. Now, this is where it gets crazy, because I'm going to tell you that, according to the Hebrew, all of these are legitimate translations. So I'm not going to look at one of these four and say, oh, this is just not accurate, because unfortunately, they actually all are. So perhaps that brings out a little bit of why Bible translation is challenging, because uh, it, it's almost like you need, yeah, you know, I've said this before, and I don't know how to pull it off, but I figure I'll, I'll constantly say it in my classes, and maybe somebody who's in one of the classes will, will decide to make it like a big life goal. I feel like we should have like a Bible translation Wikipedia, so that now before you, before you freak out about that, because that might sound kind of weird, let me tell you what I mean. I think if there was online a place where somebody could say, look, here's how I think this verse should be translated. And then somebody else could like comment on it or something and say, well, you know, that's good, but you could also translate it like this. Just think about how cool that would be because you could go through it and you could see, oh, look, you know, there's actually eight different ways to read this verse and they all, you know, they all work anyway i don't know could be a little bit like anarchy but if i think it could also be really good so the question becomes when you're a bible translator and you look at this and you realize okay there's four different ways to translate it how do you decide which especially if they're all okay right well context is one of the major determiners now, I actually just found out yesterday that I used that word determinant wrong. Apparently, that's an adjective. Uh, I meant, well, anyway, I mean, it's one of the major things that allows you to determine what it means. So let me show you this. Context means, like, what do the verses around it say? So translators often will be revising their translations as they go, because you might find something in Genesis 2 that makes you say, oh, that's what it was saying. And so then you go back and you switch your Genesis 1 translation. So it's, it's sort of a funny thing. Like translations are kind of fluid until you've translated everything. So for instance, here's an example of context. This is Genesis 1 verse 2. Here it is in the Hebrew. This is how it starts. This is vaha aretz haita. That's how you would say that. This is not a normal construction. So... I want you to pay attention. Let me see if I can annotate. Yeah, I can. Okay. Pay attention to this. See this little line thing right here? Now, depending on where you learn Hebrew, it's going to be called by a different name. So if you're taught Hebrew by a Christian, they're going to call it a wow. As in like, wow, that was awesome sort of thing. If you learn Hebrew from a Christian, they're going to call it a wow. If you learn Hebrew from a Jew, they're going to call it a vav. So that's just an interesting difference between... Uh, some of the pronunciation between uh, modern Israel today and seminaries. So this vav or wow is the word and in Hebrew. It's very um, simple, which is nice. So if you want to say and in Hebrew, all you do is you put this little line in front of a word. Okay. The reason that this is not a typical construction 
is because in Hebrew, something that you do not do is you do not put and in front of a noun. So if you remember, a noun is a person, place, thing, idea, right? Person, place, thing, idea. It's like love, dog, you know, house, any of those kind of things, right? That's a noun. These vavs or these wows, this word and, it does not go in front of a noun. When you put it in front of a noun, this is, it's supposed to have this kind of effect. You know, you're supposed to be reading and it's like nice and pleasant. You're reading, oh, this is interesting. And then all of a sudden you read and, and then a noun, and you're supposed to go, ah, you know what, what happened? Like, it's not supposed to be there. What's going on? You know, it'd be like, uh, it's kind of like the equivalent in English of like if you were to put an upside down exclamation point somewhere, right? Like if you were reading a novel and you saw an upside down exclamation point, you'd stop and say, ah, why is that there? Like, what's that doing? So that's what's supposed to happen here. You're supposed to stop. Hey, what's that thing doing here? It's not supposed to be there. It's supposed to be in front of this word because this word is the verb. And in Hebrew, verbs always take the word and, not nouns. Okay. So you might be wondering, all right, so that's interesting. What's the point of this? Well, here's the point. The point is that when you have this vav, wow thing on a noun, it's called a disjunctive wow or a disjunctive vav, meaning it like, cuts off what you've just been reading from everything that came before. That's like its big function. It jars you so that whatever you were reading about, you recognize, oh, now we're starting over. This is like a new thing. In other words, the Hebrew separates verse one from verse two. Okay. In addition to that, it says these words, which I think are really fun rhyming words. It's tohu vavohu. Okay, let's talk about what this all means. Genesis 1 1 says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Genesis 1 verse 2 starts with, and there's that disjunctive vav, and whoa, that's what you're supposed to say, and the earth was without form and void. The Hebrew grammar there is suggesting there's two different things going on. God creates the heaven and the earth in verse one. Then separately, the earth is without form and void. It's like there was something that happened in verse one. It lived out its life. And now what's left of it is the earth is without form and void. That's those words, tohu vavohu, without form and void. There's one other place where those words are used, and it's Jeremiah 4, verse 23 in the, in the Hebrew scriptures. And Jeremiah 4, verse 23 says that God is going to make Israel tohu vavohu. He's going to make them without form and void. It's definitely a reference back to, to creation. And it's God saying, I'm doing this, which I think implies Genesis 1 verse 2 is saying he did it then too. So anyway, what I would suggest is that translation is based on interpretation the way how how somebody interprets the context so when i read genesis 1 verses 1 and 2 i read it as saying that there were multiple beginnings so there was one beginning when god created the heavens and the earth another beginning when the earth was without form and void and that's when he says let there be light and there's light let there be seas and there's seas so that's, that's how I read it. So if I were translating Genesis 1 verse 1, I would translate it as, in a beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, obviously, a lot of translators disagree with me because they translate it as, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And, and that's fine. You know, and that's one of the exciting things, I think, about translating the Bible is I can say to all them, I think you're wrong. And they can say to me, I think you're wrong. And, you know, and, and we'd say, okay, well, you know, we're all still friends, but it's good to, it's good to look at the differences and good to be able to compare and understand where 
people's ideas come from, where translators' ideas come from. So that's what I'm hoping this class can kind of do for you to bring about like uh, a little bit of a, a feeling of, okay, that's where these translations are originating. That's why it's being translated like this. Because I think a lot of people often treat translations as though it's just about grammar, but it's not. Like, it's not just, you know, what do these words say? Okay, make a translation. It's kind of like, well, what do these words mean? Right? And then you make a translation. So sometimes people will say things like, oh, the translators were wrong. I have to say, I feel like that's just a really silly thing to say. Because number one, like these are people whose lives are totally like dedicated to these languages. They probably aren't wrong. And <laughs> number two, you know, these translations are usually made up of committees of like 70, 80 people, right? Like if, if one of them comes out with a wrong translation, one of the other 69 is probably gonna say, uh, that doesn't make any sense. You know, so there's there's a lot of safeguards there. Okay, or sometimes people will say things like, I don't know what the translators were thinking, or this word really means this. And that's not really how it goes. What I would suggest is maybe something like another possible translation is, or this could also be read as something like that. And then explain why you think the context supports what you say. Okay. So now here's what happens when translators have to make a translation. So this is where we were at before. This is Genesis 1 verse 1. These are the four options, right, that we came up with. And we said these are all good translations, right? Well, when a translator translates a passage, what do they have to do? They can't just say, oh, this verse could be translated these four ways. Can you imagine opening up a Bible that, that said that for Genesis 1 verse 1? You'd be like, you know, this Bible's whack. What is this? You know, what's going on here? And, and you'd put it away. Like you just would, you wouldn't understand why are there four different versions of the first one? So what a translator has to do is a translator has to say, well, this is the version I think makes the most sense. And when they do, all of a sudden, the other versions go away. You don't know that those are legitimate translations. So that's kind of what I'm hoping to bring out here, is that uh, a translator, just by very nature of translating, has to choose one. But that doesn't mean that other translations aren't right. OK. So I want to read this to you because I feel like this is probably one of the best explanations of translation that I have found. Now, I will also give you a disclaimer. This is from the King James Version, and it's the translator's message to the reader. Because it's from the King James Version, that means it was written in 1611, which means that a lot of the words are kind of crazy. But here's what they say, because I, I feel like it's really, it's really helpful. The translators of the King James Version said this, some peradventure, that means kind of like maybe, some might have no variety of senses to be set in the margin, lest the authority of the scriptures for deciding of controversies by that show of uncertainty should be somewhat shaken. Let me translate this. What they're saying here is they wanted to have what they called a margin. So margin is basically like footnotes. So they wanted to have footnotes. And back then in 1611, having footnotes was considered bad. People would look down on you because they'd be like, oh, you couldn't make up your mind on what you, know, what you think this should say. So the King James translators are like, no, actually, we just wanted people to have options to know that this could be translated in multiple ways, right? So they said, we hold our judgment not to be so sound in this point, which is a nice way of saying they're wrong. It hath pleased God in his divine providence here and there to scatter words and sentences of that difficulty and doubtfulness, not in doctrinal points that concern salvation, for in such it hath been vouched that the scriptures are plain, but in matters of less moment 
that fearfulness would better beseem us than confidence. You got to say one thing about the King James translators. They sound cool when they say stuff. Now, as far as like what they mean, that's a little trickier, <laughs> but, but it sounds good, doesn't it? Fearfulness would better beseem us than confidence. <laughs> sounds like, uh, you know, you need like a suit of armor or something like it. It's, it's like medieval. <laughs> okay. So what they're saying here is God has used words that are hard to understand. That's why they say difficulty and doubtfulness. They say not in doctrinal points. So as far as like the message of salvation, they say it's pretty easy to translate those kind of places. The message of salvation, the news about Jesus, all of that, they say it makes sense. But in certain places, in matters of less moment, that's their fancy way of saying in less important spots, fearfulness would better beseem us than confidence. So we should tread lightly is what they're saying. So in certain places, there's some of the words are hard to figure out what they're saying. Okay. So here's how they go on to explain this. There be many words in the scriptures, they put Greek in, hapax legomena, which be never found there but once, having neither brother nor neighbor as the Hebrews speak. So we cannot be holpen, holpen by conference of places. Ah, okay. <laughs> here's what that means. A hapax legomenon or here they, they use the plural in Greek, hapax legomenon. That means a word that shows up one time in the entirety of the Bible. Now you can imagine as a translator, that would be a challenge because um, the way that translators figure out what do these words mean is usually by saying, well, how else are these words used throughout the Bible? So let's look at the 50 other places where this word shows up. So in some of these cases, they, say oh i've never seen that word before let's try and find the other places where it shows up in the bible and they look and they say oh it doesn't show up anywhere well that's kind of challenging it's not like they can just go look at their like you know ancient hebrew dictionary because back in the 1600s these were the guys who made the ancient hebrew dictionary and they made it based off of the way that the bible used these words so they were they were saying like there's some words they're used one time in the Bible, and we have no idea what they mean. <laughs> so that's basically what they're trying to say. So they say, again, there be many rare names of certain birds, beasts, and precious stones, etc., concerning which the Hebrews themselves are so divided among themselves for judgment. So some of the examples they give are of some birds, some rocks, um, and they just say, we had no clue what these things were. So if you've ever read the story about the tabernacle it's in the book of exodus and it's when god tells the israelites you're going to build the tabernacle and you're going to build it out of this kind of skin like you're going to uh, overlay it with skins well depending on what bible translation you read you will notice that you get all kinds of different things some some translations will say it's porpoise skins which I don't, you know, I have no idea where they're going to find porpoise skins in the desert, but some, some Bible translations will say that, right? Because the translators just didn't know. Some will say badger skins. Some will say things like hyrax skins. Like what even is a hyrax? But uh, they'll, you know, they'll put, put those things in. So what the King James translators were trying to say is there's some words where we were really just guessing, you know, we didn't know because it didn't show up anywhere else. So we actually wrote that as the footnote. We don't know what this is. <laughs> so, and, you know, they're trying to be honest about it. So they finish this up by saying, now in such a case, doth not a margin do well to admonish the reader to seek further? So isn't it good to have a note telling the reader we don't know? So that the reader doesn't conclude or dogmatize on this or that preemptorily. You know, how dumb would it be for somebody to get in a fight with somebody else? And, you know, this is what happens in religious circles, right? People fight a lot, unfortunately, <laughs> about silly things sometimes. And, and, you know, somebody would be like, oh, yeah, I think it was porpoises that were on the tabernacle. And, you know, somebody else will say, oh, well, it was badgers. And, and you know, they go back and forth. And the King James translators here say, look, nobody knows. So don't argue about it. That's what they're, that's what they're trying to say. Okay. So my point is, is that some translations have decided to just tell you 
we weren't sure how to translate this or like this didn't make any sense to us and you'll you'll find that in some places um in other cases you'll find a marginal rendering or a footnote that says it could also be translated like this so in some cases you will get uh extra translations um and that's really the translators trying to say we didn't know so it's not like the translators weren't good at hebrew or greek they didn't know what they were doing or something like that it's really just this could actually go either way okay we're gonna pause there and uh, it looks like it's break time so why don't we take a 10 minute break if you have any questions for me feel free to type them in the chat um, and i'll also i'll open it up to questions uh, when we come back as well so if you want to just ask them uh, through zoom that's fine too but we'll take a 10 minute break then we'll come back and wrap this up all right i'll see you at 207 thanks everyone
Hello, the two of you. <laughs> All right. Hi, everyone. Oh, I Welcome see him back. a little bit early. It's not 207 yet. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> nice to be back. Oh, there we go. Now it's 207. Yeah, thanks. God forbid you start at the wrong time. <laughs> <laughs> there, was, there was one time I was teaching and I ended a couple minutes early and I got a whole bunch of complaints about it. So wow. <laughs> I know, man, people were apparently a little antsy. Okay, uh, I see that there's a couple of questions here, which is exciting. Um, I, I love these questions. I find this kind of thing to be so um, deep and there's so, so many things you can ask. So the, the first question here is wondering um, about the continuous discovery or uncovering of biblical scrolls. How much of an impact do they have on these translations? So, that is a really fascinating question. Um, and the reason, the reason for it is uh, there are a lot of different kinds of scrolls that get found. So um, it's, hard to, it's hard to give like a general answer. It really depends on the scroll. So if a scroll is found that is considered to be like extremely valuable, it's going to have a big impact on translation. Um, so let me give you an example. So there's two major codexes or codices of the, uh, of the Christian scriptures, so of the New Testament scriptures. And uh, when I say codex, what I mean is like they're like a compilation of all the books together. Um, so these codexes or these codices, um, nobody knew about them until the 1800s. And the whole thing is kind of a crazy story. There's a guy named Tischendorf, and uh, he decided to travel down to Egypt in the 1800s. He's kind of like an Indiana Jones type of figure, although not really, you know, without like the classiness. <laughs> so so he, uh, he traveled down to Egypt and he was visiting a monastery in the Sinai Peninsula. And as he was there in the monastery, he noticed that um, there were these manuscripts that were gonna be burned for as like firewood, right? So he sees them and he says, oh, you know, can I just uh, see what it is that you're gonna burn? And he looks at it and he reads it because he knew Greek and Hebrew. And he realizes that it's actually a copy of the Bible. And so he was like, uh, why don't you just burn something else? You know, I'll, I'll take this and uh, figure it out. And they didn't want to let him have it. So he actually stole it and ran away, <laughs> um, which, you know, I guess is kind of questionable as far as a Bible scholar is concerned. So he steals it and runs away, goes back to Europe. And it turns out that it is the oldest complete form of the Bible ever found. Um, it's dated to about the fourth century CE. 
and it is um, nearly complete. So it's kind of crazy. It's called Codex Sinaiticus. Um, it is, it's in the British Museum, if you want to go see it today. So it's in the British Museum, and uh, it's, it's largely considered by the British Museum to be one of their prized possessions. So um, that, when that was discovered in the 1800s, that had a major impact. So if you've ever wondered, like, why are newer translations, um, like the English Standard Version, the New Living Translation, why are those different than the King James Version? And some places, like, the King James will have stories or verses that those just don't even have at all. Like, why, why is that? And a lot of that is because of Codex Sinaiticus. Um, because that is considered to be one of the most accurate, because it's so complete. It's considered to be one of the most accurate, and nobody knew that it existed when the King James was translated. In addition, like, now, it, in contrast, like, that was a codex, but there's things called lectionaries that are found fairly frequently. Now, when I say fairly frequently, I don't mean, you know, every minute or so, but I mean, you know, every few years, somebody's finding a lectionary, which is also considered a biblical manuscript, but uh, it's significantly newer. So that this would be from like the Middle Ages or something like that. And for the most part, people would look at that and be like, eh, you know, that's not that hugely important, not really going to change a lot of things. So it really depends on what it is that's found. Um, Sinaiticus and Vaticanus are the two major codexes. Um, Vaticanus was another, another one that was, um, it was a weird story of its discovery. It was also found in the 1800s. Um, it was found in the archives in the Vatican, which is why it's called Vaticanus. Uh, nobody had looked at it. Somebody was just going around one day and they saw it on the bookshelf and said, oh, I wonder what this is. And then they said, oh, wait, this is a really old copy of the Bible. And Sinaiticus and Vaticanus um, are dated to about the same time, those two codices, and they very much huh? uh, reflect each other. Um, I'm on a, in a class, David. <laughs> so they very much, they reflect each other a lot. So in a lot of cases, um, if Sinaiticus and Vaticanus both have a certain reading, then the translators will go with that. Um, the Dead Sea Scrolls are a whole other story as well. We won't go into that right now, but uh, they, they're, they're, they are fascinating because they changed how scholars viewed the Septuagint. For a long time, the Septuagint Bible was just kind of seen as like this messed up uh, version that had a whole bunch of mistranslations, and the Dead Sea Scrolls changed, turned that all around completely. So, yeah, very interesting. Okay, uh, there was another question about says, can't the translation also be impacted by the practices, norms, or beliefs of the time period they were written in? Yes. So that's what we're about to go into now, because I, I find that to be really, to me, you know how I said that this was fun? This is where it gets fun, because I think it's funny to look at how, like, modern things, you know, modern in the time of the King James Version, how those were put into a translation, and you look at it, and you think, what? Nobody knew what that was at the time of the Bible. You know, that kind of thing. Or like unicorns. Unicorns show up in the Bible. I don't know if you were aware of that. But uh, there's a handful of passages where there's unicorns. So we'll talk about those kind of things um, in our last like 45 minutes here. Uh, okay. Yeah. And then uh, it looks like there was a response that says uh, context could be considering the surrounding biblical text as well as cultural, political. Yeah, that's right. How did the serpent turn into a snake and the fruit into an apple? Um, the Hebrew word for serpent and snake often are interchangeable with one another. Uh, however, the, uh, the idea between the serpent, like being able to walk and whatnot, um, the serpent gets cursed by God in Genesis chapter three to slither on its belly. So that apparently is how things changed. I guess serpent was supposed to have been able to walk before that. And how did the fruit get turned into an apple? You know, that is a very fascinating question. I think that's just a cultural thing. Somebody was just like, you know, I bet it was an apple. Now, really, I mean, if you're talking about Israel, I think you're probably more likely for it to have been a pomegranate or something like that. But, uh, you know, it's probably unlikely that somebody will try and like bite through a pomegranate, though. Okay.
let's take a look at this. So as I said, we're going to be talking about personal context. This is called the bias of personal context. And I've broken it down into three sections here. You can have a historically inaccurate translation. So meaning it doesn't actually uh, fit with what people would have said back then. Like it doesn't, it doesn't match historically with what people would have said or thought at the time, but it preserves the sense or the meaning. So that would be like using an expression today. You know, if you read something in the Bible where somebody said, wow, that's great. And you translated it as that's cool or something like that. You know, like nobody back then in Bible times would say that's cool, but it, you know, it preserves the sense because saying that's great and that's cool. You know, they're kind of the same. You could have one that's historically inaccurate and doesn't preserve the sense. That would really be like the worst of both worlds. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't match historically with what people would have said. And it's not even what, like, it doesn't even preserve the meaning. Then you could have one that's historically accurate, but not contemporary, as in like, it, it did match what people would have said back then, but people today can't make any sense of it. So that's not a very useful translation either. You know, if you're trying to translate the Bible, you want people to be able to make sense of what it says. So here's the main message for this section. Translation is biased. You know, I, I hope that doesn't like burst your bubble at all or anything along those lines, but you know, that's just how everything is, right? Everything in life is biased. Um, and, and you got to try and compare sources and read multiple translations in order to try and get past some of the bias. Okay. And even like, it's not because people are trying to be biased. That's just how it goes. You know, as humans, we are biased people and we might not even notice it. Here's your why question. Why are there unicorns in the Bible? What's up with that? Okay. So here we go. All right. I want you to take a look at these three pictures. So we're going to talk about translators' personal contexts, as in the culture that they live in, the time period that they're in, all of that. Now, these are three translation committees. I'll tell you the versions. I want to see if you can guess what, uh, what versions they are. So one is the King James. Okay, I recognize that one's not very hard to figure out. So one is the King James version. One is the English Standard Version. And one is the New International Version. Okay, so you have King James, English Standard, New International. So any thoughts on which one's which? I'll take a stab. All right. Um, the King James, of course, is the bottom one. Yep. The one on the uh, top right is the English Standard, and the one on the top left is the newer one. Yeah, yeah, about. that's right. Yeah, the New International. Very good. You're right. It's uh, it's one of those things that I got to tell you, I never thought about this until until working on this study. I never thought about who translates the Bibles that people read. But it's funny because you know, you really should. It makes a lot of sense. Like these are the people who are coming up with what you are reading. And it's helpful to know where they're from. For instance, you might not be surprised to know that everybody who translated the King James Version was from the UK, <laughs> right? So that, that impacts their translations. They were all from the 1600s. They all dressed like that. Not that that makes a big difference, but uh, they, they all dressed that way. And they, uh, most of them were Anglicans. There were a handful of Puritans, but for the most part, they were Anglicans. Now, on the top right, the English Standard Version, you will notice that most of the people in the English Standard Version, they're all men, first of all. So everybody's a man. Everybody's white. And uh, I'm not sure I see anybody on there who's under 50. So that's another thing, right? All, like, middle-aged or above white men. Then... Congress today. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> what was that? Oh, I said, our Congress today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's interesting, right? Now, the New International Version is a little bit different. You might notice that there's two women on that committee. So that's something that the New International Version did on purpose. They wanted to make sure that they had women scholars. So they had women scholars on there. 
Um, there is also one Indian man. Uh, I mean, like from India. Um, and that's that's about, you know, that's like the most diverse translation committee you're going to see today, which I think is fascinating because as far as diversity goes, it's still not very diverse. <laughs> not at all. Right. So that I think is a is an interesting thing to just kind of pay attention to, particularly as we're talking about the backgrounds of translators and why they translate the way they do. Okay. So these are the three ways that I broke translation down. Historically inaccurate, but carries the sense. Historically inaccurate, but doesn't carry the sense. And historically accurate, but only fits the contemporary audience. Um, so like, as in people today can't understand it. So let's just take a look at this. Um, at, when we look at this third one, we're gonna talk about how some words have died out or new ones have been invented. And this is the one I find the most fascinating. Some words have changed their meaning. So I wanna take a look at that. Okay, so here's an example. Translation is historically inaccurate, but it carries the sense. So in other words, this would not have made any sense at the time that the Bible was actually written in Hebrew, this translation. Here's how the Living Bible says it. See if you can uh, find the contemporary part of this. The Living Bible says, Psalm 18, verse 28, you have turned on my light. The Lord my God has made my darkness turn to light. Any thoughts there? What's... What, uh, what's historically inaccurate about this? Turned on my light. Turn on my light, right? <laughs> no, nobody turned lights on and off back then. You know, there were no light switches, nothing like that. Okay, it preserves the sense though, right? That, that the whole idea is that God is like a light. God makes darkness turn to light. So that, that picture of turning on the lights and all the darkness goes away, it preserves the sense of what that verse is saying. Here it is in the Hebrew. It's ta'ir nare, and that really translates to "you will light my lamp." So, if you want to be a little more, a uh, little more accurate, a little more historically accurate, you probably translate it as "you will light my lamp." But you can see what the Living Bible is doing. Now, in translations that are more literal, in fact, you will notice that they still do this too. So, here's an example of the King James, which is known as being a pretty literal translation. King James version did the same thing. Although we might not notice it just because uh, we're not used to reading things that are old. So see if you can find the issue here where the King James is historically inaccurate. It says, for thou wilt light my candle. The Lord my God will enlighten my darkness. Do you notice anything historically inaccurate there? Again, it's the candle. I mean, instead of the lamp. Candles right. didn't exist in the Bible, right? right? Which is kind of funny because i think if we think of you know when the candles start to exist it's really like 1600s or so that candles became a big thing so yeah we might we might not notice that because candles in itself are old but yeah that also doesn't historically fit so ancient israelites did not have candles they had this right you would put oil in the basin and then you would like light a wick that came out of this hole over here this is actually from an archaeological dig in Israel. Um, so this is a, a lamp that has been found. Okay. This is a translation called the message. I don't know if any, if any of you have heard of that one. This is the message. And you'll notice how it also is historically inaccurate. So we have, after the death of Moses, the servant of God, God spoke to Joshua, Moses' assistant. Moses, my servant, is dead. Get going. Cross this Jordan River, you and all the people. Cross to the country I'm giving to the people of Israel. I'm giving you every square inch of the land you set your foot on, just as I promised Moses. Now, there's two things there that I noted as being historically inaccurate, right? Get going is a contemporary idiom, right? If you think about it, an idiom is a, is a phrase that doesn't actually mean, make any sense when you just look at the words that comprise it, right? So get going doesn't make any sense if you don't know what it means because you can't actually literally get a going like there's no such thing as a going that you can go and get so that doesn't make any sense and then every square inch obviously they didn't use inches back then so my my point is just like all translations do this so i'm i'm trying to go through and show some of the more like conservative ones that are labeled that way like the king james it does it the message is labeled as more of the liberal ones and it does it too so this is a thing that all translations do 
Here's one that I think is really funny. See if you can find it here. This is about Samuel the prophet, and he has anointed Saul as the first king of Israel. Samuel the prophet has anointed Saul as the first king of Israel. Do you see how the contemporary context influenced the translators? Samuel said to all the people, see him whom the Lord hath chosen. There is none like him among all the people. All the people shouted and said, God save the king. God save the king, <laughs> right? Of you out there. Yeah, what? God save the king? You know, what's that? Okay, yeah. And in fact, this shows up in a number of places in the King James Version. And you might not be surprised to know that in the Hebrew, it translates as, or the Hebrew just says, Vayahi HaMelech, which means, may the king live. There's nothing about God. There's nothing about saving any of that. The reason that the translator said, God save the king is because that's what you said in England, right? When you wanted to say, we hope the king lives a long time, that kind of thing, you say, God save the king or God save the queen. So when they saw something that was like that, the translators were like, oh boy, here's where we can put it in, you know, and get some brownie points. Okay. So, so there's an instance of that. Okay. This one's a little harder. See if you can find this. This is in in the Christian scriptures, James, James, the apostle gets arrested by Herod. And it says, when he, that's Herod, when Herod had apprehended him, this is Peter. Um, so he arrests James, he executes James, then he arrests Peter. When he had apprehended him, that's Peter, he, Herod, put him in prison and delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. This is a challenging one. Easter? Easter, yeah. Yeah, that's yeah good job. Easter. Yeah, Easter didn't exist then. Like no. nobody nobody celebrated Easter, right? Easter was a thing that came right around the 300s um, to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. It happened when, um, when Constantine took over the Roman Empire. He mm -hmm. made Christianity the state religion. Well, he didn't. He made Christianity tolerated. Theodosius later in 380 uh, made, made Christianity the state religion. But Easter wasn't a thing at the time back in the first century so this really if you look at it in the in the uh, greek it's pascha which is the word passover so this should say passover but the king james translators decided to translate it as easter okay so translators contexts really influence what they do and sometimes you can get the historically inaccurate as we were just looking at but that still carry the sense right saying easter versus passover well, that still gives you the right time of year, right? Passover and Easter, they're at the same time usually. But sometimes you get stuff that's totally not right at all. Like it matches, it's historically inaccurate and it doesn't even match what the Hebrew or the Greek says. That's the case with these unicorns. Okay, now I have um, a lot of little girls. I have four little girls. Uh, and it's, it's great. You know, my life is filled with a lot of fun little girly things and I like it. It also means that my life is filled with a lot of unicorns and rainbows and all that stuff. Right. So when I saw that unicorns were in the Bible, I was like, yes, you know, this is awesome. Like I'm going to, I'm totally going to show my daughters unicorns in the Bible, all that. Then come to find out, no, actually, this is just an instance of translators reading things into the Bible that aren't actually there. So here it is. This is from the King James Version. This is from Deuteronomy 33. This is a song about Israel. It says, Israel's glory is like the firstling of his bullock. His horns are like the horns of unicorns. Okay. So the horns of unicorns. Now, you might notice already something there that gives you a hint that this is not actually about a unicorn. It says horns plural right now how are you going to have a unicorn with two horns like that that just doesn't work you know that's that's like an oxymoron okay well it's definitely dual so if you were going to translate this what you get is you have two horns are like the horns of one unicorn that's what the hebrew grammar actually says so this is definitely not a thing with one horn it's not a unicorn it can't be according to the hebrew uh, archaeologists think it was probably this thing this was the horn uh and the beast was called an auroch 
kind of like an ancient bull type of thing. So really, this isn't unicorn at all. So the question is, well, where did this come from? Like, where did the King James translator people, where did they, where did they get unicorn from? You know, did they just have a lot of daughters and they wanted to put unicorns in the Bible or something? You know, what, what was, what was the deal? Well, they were probably influenced by the Septuagint because the Septuagint reads mono kerontos, which would translate to mono as one, right? And kerotos means horn. So the Septuagint reads one horn. The Vulgate, anybody know what the Vulgate is? It's a Catholic um, uh, yes. interpretation. Yes, so the Vulgate was, it was another one of the first translations, but it came about 600 years or so after the Septuagint. So there weren't a lot of translations. Um, so about 600 years later, like 400 CE or so, Jerome was his name. Uh, mm -hmm. Depending on who you are, you might call him Saint Jerome. He decided to translate the Greek Bible into Latin. So he translates the Greek into Latin, and that's what becomes the Vulgate. So the Vulgate was the Bible that was used for the majority of the Middle Ages because most people didn't know Greek. Uh, most people couldn't, you know, you weren't allowed to translate the Bible into vernacular languages. When people tried to do that, the church burned them, which is kind of a weird part of church history. Um, so, so uh, the Vulgate was kind of what any what everybody got, and when people stopped reading Latin, that kind of made it hard to read the Bible. But well, excuse the, me, can I ask a quick question? Wasn't yeah. he also commissioned by the Pope of the time to do that translation? I mean, wasn't weren't often these people commissioned by certain people? Yeah, or, I'm trying to remember exactly what the that? story was. Um, it wasn't the Pope. It was uh, it was a woman. Uh, but I don't remember her name. She was yeah. a she was like a wealthy uh, patroness. Yeah. And she wanted yeah she wanted a Latin version of the Bible to exist, so she hired Jerome. Um, and his his big deal was that he actually went and learned Hebrew um, and learned Greek. So he did the Old Testament from Hebrew and the and the New Testament from Greek. Um, but not a lot of people had done that. He was apparently like he was supposed to be a, a polyglot or whatever that's called somebody who could learn languages really quickly. Mm -hmm. um, Laura, you have a question? Yes. What version of the King James are we referencing as we uh, go through this? Because I know there are different versions, right? Ooh, yes. Okay. <laughs> so I will, I'll tell you the specific here. This yeah. is the Oxford 1769 version. So that is, that is the version that is typically used when people reference the King James. Um, the, reason, the reason for that is mainly because uh, if we reference the 1611 one, there's not a lot of differences, but uh, the big difference is spelling. Um, a lot of Fs look like Ss. Okay, so the Vulgate reads rhinoceratis. <laughs> And uh, here, here's the Vulgate in Psalm 22, 22. You'll notice it says unicornium right there. <laughs> unicornium and Isaiah 34 verse seven reads unicornase. So there in the Vulgate, you've got this whole unicorn idea and that seems to have influenced the King James. So again, it's an, in, it's an example of how people are influenced by their personal context because the Vulgate was still held in high esteem in the 1600s. Okay, here's a really interesting one. All right, this is from the English Standard Version. This is 1 Timothy 3, verse 8. Now, we're going to read about deacons. Now, according to this translation, a deacon sounds like something very official, right? Listen to this. Deacons, likewise, must be dignified, not double-tongued, not addicted to much wine, not greedy for dishonest gain. Now, according to our context today, we know a deacon as somebody who's in like a church office, right? So they're, they're kind of like on the board of directors sometimes of churches, that kind of thing. So it sounds like an official position. Well, you ready for this? Here's your word in Greek. It is diakonos. Does that sound, you know, anything like deacon? Diakonos? It's the same word. It, uh, it's actually just 
it was this is what's called transliter transliteration. It's when a word from another language comes into English. So transliteration is what happened here. The word deacon is actually a Greek word that just didn't get translated. It entered into English. Now, that's funny because do you know what it actually means? It actually just translates to the word servant. Now, try reading this translation with the word servant instead of deacon, right? A servant, likewise, must be dignified, not double-tongued, not addicted to much wine, not greedy for dishonest gain. That creates a very different understanding of what's going on in this verse. Like, on one hand, by translating it as deacons, the translators made it sound like, oh, this is an official church thing, you know, a deacon. Whereas a servant doesn't really sound like that. You know, it sounds like, well, any, anybody could do this. You know, they want to serve somebody else, right? Well, look at what the King James does. The King James version reads like this. For they that have used the office of a deacon well, purchase to themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Now, you know what's crazy? Office of a deacon, that's not even in the Greek at all. That word office isn't there, of's not there, any of that. It's those who have been servants is what the Greek says. They purchase to themselves a good degree. Okay. So that's kind of a funny, funny sort of deal. And this just shows you sort of the power that translators have, right? And this is why it's a good thing to look at other versions. Because if you look at other versions, you're not going to see the whole office deal. Doesn't okay. it also pretend though, this whole idea about um, different degrees of, of uh, uh, importance or whatever, whereas a servant of God could mean anyone who was following uh -huh. God, not, you know. So, and that's what I just put there on the bottom of the screen. Official church positions were read into the Bible. They were, well, I shouldn't say read into, they were translated into the Bible. Now, before you, uh, before you feel like that means that you should go to your church and, you know, tell everybody who's a, a deacon or a presbyter and an elder or anything like that, that that's not biblical. That's, that's not what I'm saying. <laughs> so, so let's not, let's not go in that direction. What I'm, what I'm saying is that in the first century, when Christianity was first being created those positions did not exist okay it was it wasn't a highly organized movement christianity wasn't for a large part it saw itself as part of judaism um, and that's a big part of what my dissertation was about you know it was it was going through and saying look like all these christians saw themselves as jews so when people read the new testament like it needs to be read as though jews are reading it because a lot of the people that the letters were written to, they understood themselves as being Jews. So anyway, that's, it's, it's a different sort of thing. Like there just wasn't the same kind of organization that churches have today. Does that mean that the organization of churches is bad? Well, I mean, you can decide that, but I don't think that's what it's saying. Like, it's just, this is a snapshot into a specific period of time. Okay. And when a lot of these stories were written, wasn't it also a time when there was a lot of infighting between um, Jews and Christians because the people who were Christians wanted to continue to be Jews, but the Jews didn't want them preaching their beliefs in their temples. And so there was a yes. lot, depending on whether they were, whether their communities were Jewish or, or not, they may have taken a different approach to how they discussed important things with them. Yeah, that's right. You know. It was highly complicated, right? Just like yeah. a lot of things are. So there was fighting amongst Christians and Jews. But I mean, you could even argue that there's fighting between Jews and Jews, because some people didn't even see themselves as Christians, even right. though they followed Jesus, right? But then there was right. also fighting between Christians and Christians, as right. to, you know, should, should all Christians get circumcised, which is how you right. demonstrate you're a Jew, right? Like, so there, there was a lot of this kind of who are we even, you know, what <laughs> people were kind of trying to figure out, like, there's a lot of confusion there. Okay, so this is interesting. This is a version we haven't looked at yet. This is called the revised standard version. So this was, this was a big deal back in the 1950s, the RSV. So this came out in the 1950s. Um, it's the, it's kind of like the predecessor to the English standard version. 
So the ESV came out of this one. Okay, so as we read this, look for the two positions, right? Because we're talking about positions within the church. So here's what it says, first in uh, Titus 1, verses 5 to 7. This is why I left you in Crete. So this is Paul writing to Titus. That you might amend what was defective and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. If any man is blameless, the husband of one wife and his children are believers and not open to the charge of being profligate and insubordinate. For a bishop as God's steward must be blameless. He must not be arrogant or quick tempered or drunkard or violent or greedy for gain. So do you see two positions? elders and bishops yeah so you got um, elders yeah. and bishops right yeah. elders and bishops and those are actually different words however if you read the new living translation you'll notice that the new living translation doesn't have elders and bishops you see that there it just says mm -hmm. elder the whole time now this again is why i say read multiple translations because it's what's going to pick these questions it's where you're going to say hey you know what's going on here right so read multiple translations now there are two different words being used so that first one up here elders that i had highlighted in green that's presbyteros now that's where presbyterian where that word comes from presbyteros and episcopos is the second word which is where episcopal comes from so you can see those two ideas, right? Presbyterian and Episcopal. Okay, so they are two different words in Greek. So the question then becomes, okay, so why did the New Living Translation translate them all as elders? Why didn't it translate one as, you know, presbyters and the other one as Episcopals or something like that, or, or elders and bishops? Well, here's why. In Acts chapter 20, verse 7, Paul goes to Ephesus. When he goes to Ephesus, he calls the elders of the church. That word elders is presbyteros. Okay, that's same as the first word that we saw in Titus. He starts talking to the elders. Here's what he says to them. Take heed to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with the blood of his own son. Now, that word overseers is the word episcopos, which is the word translated as bishops in Titus. So what Acts chapter 20 is doing here is it says Paul's talking to the elders, right? And he calls the elders bishops. So the reason that the New Living Translation didn't go back and forth between elders and bishops is because Here's that whole context idea, right? When you're translating and you're looking at context, the New Living Translation looked back at Acts and said, oh, well, wait a minute, elders are bishops. And so it decided to say, this is all about one group of people. This is all about elders. So interesting, right? Like it's, it's just, it's a helpful way. It's helpful to see that these kinds of questions are there, I think. Okay. And, it, and it also brings a question for me is that elders may have been a very different thing back then than what we interpret elders to be today. It seems to be significantly more broad. Yeah. Yep. Um, which again, I think fits with the whole idea that the first century church was not highly organized. It was, it was just, you know, these people came up and they acted, they filled leadership positions and that was that. Okay, now, this is why multiple versions are helpful, I think, because some of these things are really difficult to spot, especially if, I mean, like for me, I read the King James Version for 25 years, and I never read anything else, you know, and as I started to read other things, and as I started to read the Hebrew and the Greek, I started to say, whoa, <laughs> you know, that, that says different stuff than what I always memorized, so I, uh, I actually, what I do now, and I, I, you know, I don't know what you'll think of this, but I actually use, I, every year, every new year, I try to read through the Bible once. So every year, I try to read through the Bible in its entirety once, and I do it in a different version each year. And that's been kind of a neat, a neat uh, 
thing to do just because number one, you pay attention because it's not, oh, you know, I've heard this a bunch of times, but it's also just interesting because you'll notice differences. Okay. So sometimes these kind of things are hard to spot. So let me, let me show you this. There is a Hebrew idiom here, but there's in the English, two English idioms. Okay. So in Job 19, verse 20, Job says, I am nothing but skin and bones. I have escaped only by the skin of my teeth. And the question is, can you find the Hebrew idiom? Probably not because we know there's two idioms, right? So I am nothing but skin and bones. That's one. And I've escaped only by the skin of my teeth. That's another. So, I mean, the whole verse is idioms. So it's these two idioms. Now, the question is, which one is actually in the Hebrew and which one is just the translators? Probably skin well, of my teeth is a Hebrew, right? Skin and bones. All right, let's, let's find out. My bones sticks to my skin and my flesh is how I would translate this. Mm -hmm. So the English idiom then is skin and bones. Skin of my teeth is, is actually in the Hebrew. So this is how I would translate the Hebrew. I escaped by the skin of my teeth. So that actually comes from Hebrew. So when you talk about skin of my teeth, you're saying a Hebrew expression, which is kind of funny. So a Hebrew idiom has entered into the English, but my, my point is, is that sometimes it's just hard to tell, right? You, you look at this and you're like, oh, well, see, there's idioms. And you might not even know that one of the idioms was actually there in the Hebrew. Or you might just figure that both were in the Hebrew you know, if you were reading the NIV. Okay, so every translation has foibles, every translation adds some things, and that's why it's helpful to read multiple translations. Now, I wanna show you this, this is where we're gonna end, and this is my favorite part. You can get a translation that's historically accurate, but it only fits the contemporary audience, as in like the King James Version, will have things that people in the 1600s maybe understood, but that we look at today and we're like, what? Like, what is that talking about? Okay, so there's instances where words have died out or new ones have been invented or words have changed their meaning. Now, where words have changed their meaning, that's the most difficult because you read it and you think, oh yeah, I get that. I know what that says. But in fact, you actually don't, right? But you don't know it because the meaning has just changed. So check this out. Here's a King James verse. See if you can explain this verse. Oh, you sons of men. How long will you turn my glory into shame? How long will you love vanity and seek after leasing? You might look at that and think, what is leasing, right? Like, is this talking about, you know, leasing a car or something? Like, is the Bible saying that you're supposed to buy a car? Like, you know, what's going on? And that doesn't make any sense. Psalm 5 verse 6 talks about the same thing. Talks about, thou shalt destroy them that speak leasing. <laughs> okay. Now, I'll tell you, I didn't know what it meant either. Okay. So I looked it up in the Cambridge Dictionary, and you know what I got? A financial arrangement in which a person company pays to use land, a vehicle. So like leasing a car. So that's not it. Okay. So the, even the Cambridge Dictionary didn't have it in it. Thankfully, Merriam-Webster came through. Merriam-Webster says, it's archaic. It means lying. So there you go. So newer translations will say, how long will you love vain words and seek after lies? Or you destroy those who speak lies, right? Here's, here's a real good one, ready? Behold, the noise of the bruit is come. A bruit. So there you go. What's a bruit? Doesn't that sound kind of like a, uh, makes me think of a really like fuzzy animal. <laughs> Here comes the bruit. Okay, there's no healing of thy bruise. Thy wound is grievous. All that hear the bruit of thee shall clap the hands over thee. Okay, so bruit. Well, once again, the Cambridge Dictionary does not know what a bruit is. This is a verb. And before, in the King James, it's used as a noun. So this isn't right. Merriam-Webster says it means noise or report or rumor. So that fits. And most modern translations will say a rumor or something like that which again, makes significantly more sense to us. So the King James was accurate historically, you know, in the 1600s, that was a word that people would use. They'd say, you know, stop that bruit to their children or whatever, I guess, you know, I wasn't there, so I don't know, but I, I assume that. Um, but now we look at that and we think like, is a bruit an animal 
right? Like, what, you know, what is this thing? So that's part of the issue. Now, this is one of my favorite quotes ever. It says here, just to drive the point home even more clearly. So this is a guy who went through the King James Version and said, here's all the words I don't know. What is the meaning of chambering? Champagne, which by the way, is not, is not an alcohol. Charger, it's not a horse. Churl, sealed, circumspect, clouded upon their feet. Right, these people clouded on their feet. A cockatrice, collops, confection, which actually has nothing to do with sugar. Coats, covert, hoised. Here's the best one. Wimples. Those are uh, apparently something that women wear. Wimples. A stomacher. Watt, whist, withs, want, shirtership, sack butt, which is an instrument. The skull, scrabbled, rollered, muffler, froward, which is not forward. Don't get those confused because I looked up froward and it means perverse. So don't ever, you know, tell somebody, I really appreciate how froward you are. It's not going to turn out well. Brigadine, immerse, blains, crooked back, descry, fanners, fellows, gleed, glistering, habergion, implead, niecing, niter, tabret, and when. <laughs> so these are some of the words in the King James that don't really work anymore. Now, here's the tricky ones. These are ones that have changed their meaning. So check this out. For if thou altogether holdest thy peace, this is in the story of Esther. This is what Esther is being told. If thou holdest thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. So enlargement and deliverance would arise to the Jews. Now, if we talked about enlargement today, we mean getting bigger, right? It sounds like, sounds like what Esther's being told is, if you don't do anything, the Jews are going to get really big, right? Which is not, that doesn't make any sense. Now, what, what it's actually saying, if you look up enlargement in an archaic dictionary, is it means relaxation. So enlargement, so they would be relaxed. So if you remember the story of Esther, Haman is trying to kill all the Jews, right? And Mordecai, Esther's cousin, is telling her, you got to do something about this. You can't just sit back. He says, but God will provide deliverance. So that's that idea of enlargement. Okay, here's a funny one. This is the fiery furnace. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are in front of Nebuchadnezzar the king. And he says, if you don't worship my God, I'm going to throw you into the fiery furnace. Okay. So you get in the King James Version, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered it and said to the king, but Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. Which, if you translate that to today, it's, we don't actually care, is essentially what that translates to. But that's not what they're saying at all. If you look at the, the original language, which in this case is Aramaic, but uh, it, they're actually saying we are really careful about what we're saying. It's the total opposite. Now, ready for this one? This is my absolute favorite. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truth breakers, false accusers. Ready for it? Incontinent. Fierce despisers of those that are good. Now, today, incontinent means that you can't hold it in, right? And that's clearly not what the Apostle Paul was saying was going to be a prophecy of the last day. <laughs> so, you know, you can see why it, it becomes important to read from a translation that... Uh, not only is historically accurate, but it's also contemporary because otherwise, you know, you could get some pretty weird ideas coming out of there. <laughs> okay. So now just to wrap this up, for those of you who might read the King James Version, as I said, I, I grew up on it um, and I, I have nothing against it. So lest it feels like an attack on the King James, I just want to point out uh, there's actually something that the King James Version does that no other version does, which uh, and this is how I want to wrap this up. That is very interesting. You maybe have noticed that the King James Version says thee and thou and ye. You know, and sometimes when people are making fun of it, they'll, they'll try and talk like King James-ish. And they'll say, you know, thou dost go to dinner or something, you know, whatever, something like that. Um, well, there's actually a reason that the King James uses those. So let me read this to you. 
It says Numbers 10, 29. It says, Moses said to Hobab, the son of Reuel the Midianite, Moses' his father-in-law, we are setting out for the place of which the Lord said, I will give it to you. Come with us and we will do good to you, for the Lord has promised good to Israel. So you'll notice that Moses says to this guy, Hobab, God said, I will give the land to you. The question is, is Moses saying that God told him that he was going to give the land to Hobab? Or did God say to Moses, I will give the land to you and the Israelites? And Moses is just saying, Hobab, we're going to go there. Do you want to come with us? It's hard to tell because we don't know what's going on with this word, you. Well, that's actually an issue with the lack of precision in English today because you used to be a plural word. If you're from the South, you might say, well, that's why we use the word y'all. Because y'all is basically the way of saying you, plural. Now, in the Hebrew, that is actually what it says. Well, I mean, it doesn't say to y'all, but it uses the, it's, it uses the plural you there. So what's, what's being said in Hebrew is Moses says, God, God told us, I will give the land to all of you. So it wasn't that God promised it to Hobab. It was that he promised it to all of Israel. Now, if you were reading the King James, you would actually notice that because the King James says you, which back in King James times was plural. And then it says the in reference to Hobab. So the King James actually uses these pronouns, you, ye, thee, and thou. It uses them in different ways. Thee and thou are singular. You and ye are plural. Kind of interesting. Okay, one last mm -hmm. example that I want to show you. So check this out. This verse gets used a lot, these two verses. The Apostle Paul says, you are the temple of God and the spirit of God dwells in you. People will use this for all kinds of things. Sometimes people use it for reasons why you shouldn't smoke, things like that. You're supposed to take care of your body. Some people use it for why you should eat healthy. Well, that's not actually what the Greek says. And if people read it in King James, they might notice because King James says your body. Notice that your, because in King James, thee and thou is plural. So it would say thy body is the temple, if it was singular. He says, which is in you, which ye have of God. So Paul is actually saying, you all together as a church are one body. Interesting, right? And that's, that's a difference that the King James shows. So my point in all of this is um, that Bible translation is hard. And there's never going to be a version that's perfect. There's never going to be one where, you know, people say, aha, this is the, the version. It's the only one ever I, I need to read. But every version, including one that was translated 400 years ago, has its perks. And so that's, that's one of those things to just be aware of and think about as you read. All right. It's 2.58. So I'm going to end it there. Does anybody have any questions? Anything you want to discuss before we finish up? Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank Beautiful. you. Yeah, You're welcome. very, very good. That was I great. Love that. Is this thank the only you. class? Are you doing more classes? <clears throat> right now, um, Linda, I think we were gonna we were gonna chat about something in the fall. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We'll 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 connect. Okay. Yeah. Sounds good. Thank All you right, very everyone. much. This was very yeah. good. Thank good you. It was Bye. nice to get to very meet you. Yeah. It was it was fun. Thank you I for enjoyed. doing it. Clearly you yeah. had fun. That made it fun. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Yeah. I just, I think this kind of thing to me is so exciting because it's the kind of thing that people don't talk about a lot. Correct. That is so um, true. Yeah. You know, yeah, I, I'll give you kinda... one other thing to, to think about too, though. And, and, yeah. and one of the things that for me makes a lot of sense, and maybe it's just me, but, you know, the Bible is interpreted by each of us. Right, and yeah. even when we when we read it over and over, we can read the same scripture today that we read two years ago. And because of the context of our own time, we'll understand it totally differently than when yes. we read it two years ago. And yeah. so to me, the Bible is, I mean, I'm not getting, but it's a living and moving kind of thing based on our own context. 
It's not yes. only the context of when it was written or who interpreted it in their context. It's also our own context in terms of what it means to us that particular time, you know? Yep. Um, so it's a, it's a really interesting thing because of that for me. It's a very uh -huh. unique book that way yeah. because yeah, uh -huh. that means yeah. something different depending on what's happening at the mm -hmm. time for you. I've, mm -hmm. I've even found that with translation, that my translation mm -hmm. of passages will, will change depending on what's happening in my life. Right, right. Yeah. Or around us, you know. You yeah. know, if you read this as things are happening around us day to day, it, it, yeah. it's really funny because it, it, it takes on new meaning, mm -hmm. you know. Yep. So for the people in the audience, um, I'm on the curriculum committee. So actually, John and I coordinated this together. If you'd like more, please write to the OLLI office or anybody you know who's connected to OLLI and let them know. Yes. All right. right, will do. Thank you very much. I appreciate your um, doing this one. Uh, yeah, I've been doing great. Bible study for years. And so, mm -hmm. so this one, this one's interesting to me because it, um, it's a different perspective. And so it, it, it's just an interesting way to look at some things too. So thank you very much for doing it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you're welcome. I, I, I enjoyed it. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy your, thank you. enjoy your kids. Yeah. <laughs> Have a good evening. You All right. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.